Festival's industry conference. Thank you for joining us live at Bell Digital Talks. As a reminder, this conversation will be available tomorrow on TIFF Digital Cinema Pro for anyone who missed it today. My name is Joanna Vicente and I'm the executive director and co-head of TIFF. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major industry supporters, Telefilm Canada and Ontario Creates. Ever since I met our next speaker over 20 years ago, I could tell he's the kind of person who has a dozen new ideas a day. I've had the pleasure of producing two films with Ted, and since then, since then, and through the work we've done together, I can say that I've never known a more innovative thinker and passionate champion of independent filmmakers. So please enjoy the following masterclass with Ted Ho. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Masterclass with Ted Hope. I'm Tatiana Siegel, Executive Film Editor at the Hollywood Reporter. I'm sure those of you in the audience today are well aware of Ted's incredible body of work as an independent film producer. If you're in the business of making movies or even a casual fan of movies, it's hard not to be. Ted is the co-founder of independent production companies Good Machine and This Is That and he recently served as head of original movies at Amazon Studios. He has produced career launching first features from countless household name directors, including Ang Lee and Nicole Halfsinger. And he, has, he counts many critically acclaimed award-winning films among his credits, spanning from In the Bedroom to American Splendor. As a reporter who's been covering the film industry over the last two decades for The Hollywood Reporter and Variety, my own career has been long intertwined with Ted's. His extensive contributions to independent cinema have been an ongoing and consistent part of our own coverage. Um, he, has a, he has written a fantastic book capturing some of the lessons he's learned over the years called Hope for Film, a producer's journey across the revolutions of indie film and global streaming. I'm so glad he's here with us today to share some of his wisdom on how to make better films and how we can recognize, prepare for, and act on the transformative changes the industry is facing today. And before I say hello to Ted, at the end of this discussion, there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask questions. So please use your chat feature on the left-hand side of your browser to send us questions at, the, at any point during the session. And we'll get to as many as we can. Thank you, and welcome, Ted. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be talking to you today about the independent film landscape and your position in this, um, you know, your career is unparalleled. So maybe let's just start with, um, you have said before that indie producing is, quote, a horrible job, but a wonderful life. Tell us more about that and perhaps starting at the beginning of your career. Well, there's probably no time that it's uh, that's truer than uh, at the very beginning. You know, it's a it's an incredible privilege to be able to get to do what you love. Right. Um, you may not get paid well to do it. You may work horrible hours. You may be, you know, surrounded by um, liars, cheats, malcontents, and uh, misanthropes. But, um, you know, it's still to, to work, you know, on the, the, the precipice uh, of inspiration and disaster is pretty thrilling. You know, uh, when you get to come to a place like the Toronto Film Festival, which really made my career in many, many ways, um, and you see that your work, your contribution to a work is going to be everlasting. There's no, nothing else that could capture that, you know? So I think that for, you know, one of the best lessons I had learned early on in my career was to, to have a small footprint, you know, to live modestly, you know, uh, keep my desires, uh, low, um, uh, and, you know, try, try to uh, not desire much uh, material uh, goods because really, you know, it was 
de- you know, well over a decade that I felt I was out of the, you know, spoon to mouth uh, existence. Um, and I had it a lot better than many people. Um, I didn't have, I, you know, <laughs> I kind of think, how did I get a career producing movies? Probably the biggest gift I had was I had the, I had been the uh, signee of a apartment lease in Manhattan in the early eighties before everything went co-op. And when my building went co-op, my fellow tenants and I organized and got a buyout and I could pay off my student loans. So I had, you know, three years I could work as a PA, you know, for 50 bucks a day in those days and strategize on how to make movies. You know, I could have a house full of wannabe filmmakers. So all we ever did, like that was when VHS also blossomed and we had a store on the block. We just watched movies. You know, we bought, you know, nickel bags of weed, you know, from a slot in the wall and watch, and watch, and watch movies nonstop for our entertainment and frankly, our intellectual and creative growth. Like we would argue about movies all the time. I was thinking, this morning, like how much those roommates meant to me in formulating my, my career. But it wasn't, quote, a career. You know, that was a, a passion and a hobby. And I just, it was what I loved to do. And eventually, you know, through, um, you, know, you know, years of, of sticking it out, it became a career. Um, and I, I think that some of the, the challenges that we have with, what has been, you know, slow progress in different areas comes precisely because how precarious that existence is. You know, like when you when you recognize that sticking in the business may be a choice of having a family or not, you know, um, or, or ever, you know, having a, a place that you actually own to, to live in. Um, it, it's really hard to kind of push and take risks and make change directions, but it's precisely those risks that I was that I took um, the willingness to kind of uh, change direction at different points that had given me my greatest growth, whether it's working with film, specific filmmakers, starting companies, leaving companies, changing cities, you know, and uh, it's so hard for most people to be able to do that. So I'm glad that uh, early on, I could pay off those loans and I could surround myself with a small network of people who felt as passionate about what I did, what I, what I also felt passionate about. Okay. It's funny when you first started to answer that question and you said, um, never was the challenge more than I thought you were going to say now. And then you said then, and other than, marijuana being legal now versus then, I would argue that it was that it would be more challenging now, no? Well, I, I, I think that um, the, the, the one thing that has become really clear to me is that the film industry, had, uh, specifically the independent side, but really the film industry has been in a constant state of disaster since the moment I set foot in it. So, uh, <laughs> And the things that I felt were mistakes, I now read much differently. Like for instance, when I came to film school, it was the year that Spike Lee, Jim Jarmusch, uh, the Coen brothers, Susan Seidelman, uh, all these different filmmakers, you know, delivered their their first work. I had seen, uh, you know, for, for me, it was Susan Seidelman, Smithereens, I, I was, uh, w- I dropped out of college. I I was going to movies virtually every day because I was my work required me to travel and I didn't know people. And I was hating the movies I saw. And then I saw Smithereens, and I was like, "Wow, that's the kind of movie I would like to make." Um, and it started me on the the path to think about uh, getting myself to New York and going to NYU. And then right off the bat. I ran, you know, on the street in different ways. I ran into all of those filmmakers, Spike Lee, Jim Jarmusch, the Coen brothers. And it felt like and in the year that I saw their first movies or second movies, um, and uh, I felt like, wow, it's entirely possible. But I was at NYU and NYU at that time was uh, totally focused on studio filmmaking you know, at least, at least in the undergrad. 
Um, even though all those filmmakers went to NYU, it was still like, this is how it's got to be done. And I was like, this is absurd. I want to make films for as little as possible. I want films that feel like they're punk rock and the French new wave and, you know, all of these things. And, um, now I realize that the, you know, the, the film industry has depended regularly on people like I was at the time, outliers, people who might think d differently, whose passion may far exceed mm -hmm. their experience to push us and drive us in new directions. And that, yes, I can look at it, that the industry and say, okay, we've just encountered the, the, the most amount of transformative change that I've experienced in my career. However, it's been a nonstop onslaught of transformative change since, you know, I arrived in New York in like 82, like it really has been. Yes, now I can articulate that we're no longer a single title revenue based, you know, a social uh, experience, uh, studio driven film ecosystem. You know, now we, we are in a streaming dominant uh, portfolio based attention driven global economy i left domestic off the uh mm -hmm. off the first one um and that's changes everything you know but we've been dealing with it you know and i'm i'm actually confident that we are going to find the better things so when that too collapses as it will and transforms mm -hmm. people will be saying oh my god i can't believe it's not that way but at least now I can look back and say, yeah, I remember when it was something different too. And each time we found a way to kind of build it for the better. Yes, a few babies will get thrown out with the bathwater, 100%. It's not sure. fair, it's not just, it's not equal, it sucks. All of that is really too, but we do make it better. It keeps improving. And when you see the speed of transformative change that culturally, like we've started to embrace, it still makes me very optimistic. So I, I would say, yes, bigger, but we've learned how to deal with it better. It's almost okay, like fair enough. As he's going to do. Okay, so in your book, you talked about Ang Lee's leadership style. Uh, I believe you said Ang Lee would never come right out and say he didn't like something. So you had to learn how to ask the right questions. Tell me how that deviated from the sort of status quo American director we kind of envision in our mind and maybe existed or maybe never existed, but. Yeah, I, I, I think, and some of this might come a little bit from the fact that I came up, you know, working in product, film crews in, in production, right? So you, I developed a uh, confirmation bias perhaps you know, of wanting things to, to be in the, the manner that I had been schooled, right? And you learn, particularly if you work in production, that the, the, the most valuable director, what you want is that uber decisive person, right? The person that just comes out and does it. And this is, our preference for that is I think at foot for many of the things that are wrong about the film industry that have limited the voices along the way. And, you know, for me, like the first step towards recognizing this was, I also had the benefit of coming up in the era of cocaine fueled production. <laughs> Not that I put part took in it, but I, cause I was a PA and, you know, uh, it was outside of my uh, class level, but, set after set you would have directors and their, their uh the and the ad's and producers like over fueled and like you know right on the edge of snapping and wanting everything to happen right away when the other things that needed to make those things happen had yet to be done and i was like I, it was easy i was uh fortunate enough to have somebody say to me when i was looking bored as a pa on set once you know your job is to recognize where the disaster is about to happen and figure out how to make it better. Whether you can actually tell anybody or not, learn that and take it to your productions. And so that's what I did every day was like ask myself, 
How do I prevent disaster from happening? How do I make it better? And when you see people losing it, you know, and always wiping their nose, you become mm-hmm. really uh, qu- quick to kind of realize, you know, this kind of on edge nervousness, overexcitedness is not necessarily the best way to have a inspirational creative set, right? So uh, it was like, maybe the way they think it should get done is not the right way to get done. And that's when I started saying to myself, okay, I think that when it comes to creative people, there is no template. There's no right way. You can have preferences. You can have rules that kind of point you to it. But if your job is to to be the collaborator that helps uh, take the good and lift it into the great, to make something better, to engineer serendipity. If that's your your role, you have to cus- it has to be a custom fit for who you're working with, right? And so, taking that to 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 heart, you know, I did have the 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 good fortune to um, a- Ang Lee. What was in the grad school? I think the year before. I think he left the year before that. I entered the undergrad as a transfer student. I only went for a year and a half. Um, but I got to see both of his student films, and they were they were superior to most of other people's work. And so I, I wrote down Ang Lee's name and figured I would find him. When you look in the Manhattan phone book under Lee, um, you quickly realize there's twice as many Lees as there are Smiths, you know, uh, and you're not going to you're not going to find that find him that way. Um, I even convinced myself because the the first film of his that caught my attention, um, what called Fine Line, um, was a romance. It was Chaz Palminteri's uh, first film. It was a short film, but it was a romance between a guy from Little Italy and a girl uh, from Chinatown because they're in New York. They're right next to each other. And it was, you know, visceral and vibrant and felt like the school of Marty Scorsese. And it was also graffiti, you know, graffiti culture was at a high end then. And I was like, oh, Ang Lee, that's actually Angle E. It's not his real name. It's a, you know, (laughs) um, something that it's his handle for graffiti. He's probably just like an Italian kid from Little Italy. I was wrong. But... uh, (laughs) The you know the the you know the first thing that struck me when I finally met him it took years to find him uh, lots of uh, failures you know I I had a plan for directors I wanted to work with that I gave to James Seamus when we uh, made the decision to work together and it had Ang Lee on it had Kelly Reichardt on it it had Jim Cohen on it uh, Phil Morrison. Nicole Hall of Center, like these were folks who had only made shorts at this point in time, but who I, you know, believed would, or music videos would, would go out and they all, you know, they all found their way. Um, and uh, Aang found me, I didn't ultimately find him. And when, when he came, you know, he came to the office at like literally like eight o'clock at night and I just happened to be there and he was super humble. You know, that, that uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, people preach that directors have to learn how to sell themselves, you know, and they think that means they have to brag, you know, that they have to say all of the great things that they can do. And then could barely, you know, look me in the eye at that point in time, or at least look up. And, uh, but he said that he did think that he, he had been tipped that he might win a screenplay contest which he did. He actually won first and second prize for, for what was uh, to become Wedding Banquet and, and Eat, Drink, Man. No, it was Pushing Hands and Wedding Banquet um, at, at that time. And, uh, you know, so so it became clear in working with him that it wasn't, you know, he wasn't somebody that was going to over... Um, express himself initially, you know, that you had to uh, play the detective. And because I had been a um, assistant director before and in kind of the process of helping people build shot lists and schedules, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a detective work, 
right? Like that was a lot of how I saw my my role. And frankly, I still like some of those lessons of how to pull things out of people to help them express the what they hope to be able to to create were lessons that that uh, really cemented, I think, during my time working with with Ang, you know, um, because. I, I think he always held like the thing that was, was I found so remarkable about working with him. He holds the entire movie in his head. He sees all of the shots connecting, like when he's repeating a shot, you know, from one section to the next, he's still thinking of all those things at once. And he doesn't necessarily lock in, at least in those days to, to the decision until he's there. And so the, the, the way that I often explain it, like, and it's in the, the, the book, is he was miserable on set uh, one day on a uh, wedding banquet. And, you know, it was a big scene and we had everybody out for it and I couldn't understand what's wrong. And I was like, I kept asking, do you like this? Do you like this? And he would say he liked it. And I was like, I don't understand why I can't get the answer out of him. What, what's wrong? And then it occurred to me to ask him, oh, did you like the, the blue dress, which he had said he liked? They said, oh, but did you like the brown dress more? And he just lit up and said, yes, I like the brown dress more. And I was like, oh, uh, why didn't you tell me that? Well, you didn't ask me that. You had just asked me if I liked it. He was, and I, I was telling the truth. And it kind of became like, oh, you have to, to move people to that decision. Um, and um, and I, I think it, it was such so helpful to me because I was, you know, being young in my career there, I, I was really kind of fixated on, oh, there is a right way to do things, right? And I think that that sort of thinking is where our industry goes wrong so, so much. Like I do try to share advice of what has worked for me, but I think that the key piece you know, and it's uh, hard to believe that someone who talks as nonstop as I do actually <laughs> then values the key is learning how to let listen, right? How do you help people express what they want to say so you can build the process around them instead of trying to impose the process on them? Uh, that's a great point. Um, and it brings me to my next question about the savages. Um, uh, at some point, you said that the crew didn't agree that allowing Tamara Jenkins that time that she needed to get things right was what was best for the film. And Fox Searchlight and the Bond Company also uh, concurred. But in your experience, were crews and studios more willing to give leeway to white male directors to take their time to finish a movie? You know, it, it's it, it's so, it's so interesting. You know, like uh, because it's it's so exciting. You know, where we are now and the change that is uh, finally starting to occur. But it's that you know you become you know uh, you start to recognize that there is a uh, people like things that they've experienced before, and they they like things that resemble themselves. And um, they they, uh, they they're very slow to 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 change. And when you try when you look at the dismal statistics that we've always had in terms of, of representation, in terms of directing across gender, you also have to ask yourself like, why is narrative you know still uh, what was it this year eleven percent of the top hundred movies or something in Stacy Smith's uh, announcement? yesterday. Um, why is it so dismal in the narrative, yet documentaries have always had, you know, equal representation? You know, back in the day before, you know, the, the, the before sound, in silent movies, the, there was close to equal representation, or at least not as bad as it is now, but mm -hmm. then just changed after that. What, why is that? And um, you what I've always thought is like, well, the big difference between documentaries and narrative uh, features or fiction features is stage financing, right? 
So uh, narratives have to get financed in full at the beginning, where at documentaries get to b deliver a proof of principle. You know, um, they they show that the 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 creators are competent and you know masters of their their form, right? And since it's rewarded on merit and on work, it naturally uh, falls in terms of equal representation, right? But the other field, you know, there is a gender in our culture that has been encouraged to brag and speak confidently and arrogantly about something they know nothing about, right? And they re get rewarded for it, right? Like I was trained from birth to say, oh, I know what I'm doing. And I was told when I entered the business, just say yes. If you, if they to ask you, can you do this? Just say yes. And, you know, I said, when I was a PA starting out, they asked me if I could drive a Winnebago. I said, yes. And I proceeded to drive it under the bridge that wasn't uh, tall enough to fit my Winnebago. And I took the top off. I knew how to oh. drive it, just not, not, not safely, you know? And that's how a lot of our, pitching and our, you know, gatekeeping has historically been done. I think it is really changing now, but uh, people would go out there and tell you that they knew exactly what they were doing, right? That th this is, I'm going to tell you the story. And even though I'm going to have to make a thousand decisions a day, and I'm not going to be able to control the outcomes, I'm going to tell you with full confidence that this is how it's going to come out, right? Now, if you actually then take it and you try to apply it to authored work, right, that I think in the nature of a work that will come from only one clear point of view when you look at it, and I'm really proud to think, you know, I think that if you look at any of the moves that I've made or been part of, only that singular director could have been the author of that work. No one else could have, could have made it. If that's what you're trying to do, you're already saying that you prefer the experiment to the proof, right? That you actually want somebody who is going to use, process through their experience the choice of what they have. So they actually don't know because of the, all the variables are coming, they actually cannot tell you if they're telling the truth, um, how things are going to come out. You can engineer things, but you wouldn't be trying to harvest serendipity you know, if you are actually believing that you are going to deliver what you know now, you're going to deliver on that day. You know, so I, you know, I, I came to feel like that was bullshit to talk in that in that way, and I didn't think it was again custom, doing that custom fit. I wasn't giving you the bespoke experience if I was trying to make you have everything determined ahead of time. Yes, I like to work through scenarios. You know, what's plan A, what's plan B, what's the minimal viable, you know, uh, thing to accomplish on that day of filming. Let's have all of that there. But it's because you're going to speak to me and I'm going to understand exactly what your ambition is, what you want to try to create. And while you're dealing with those details, I'm going to be doing my best to bring those things together so that you get the opportunity to, to deliver more than what's expected. That's not a calm place. You know, like there are people that process that really well, but they're superhuman. They were gifted with some other thing our, us mere humans do not have. You know, the proper reaction to being given a thousand decisions with a thousand variables, you know, that level of complexity that you're being asked to render into beauty, right? Like that's alchemy, right? If that, 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 that the proper response to that is to shut down and cry. That's really what a human being should do in the job of directing. So if somebody is managing to, to just say, I need a minute to think about this, let's give them that minute. And let's not say, oh, you're a total failure and we're not going to make our day. You know, like, you know, I'm not going to benefit, the public's not going to benefit, the director's certainly not going to benefit, the studio's not going to benefit to, to something that is good or just good enough, right? We don't have a place for that anymore. We have to engineer our films into a place of, of real distinction and merit 
into something else. Um, and I would actually say, you know, and if I characterize this in the book, then I must have done it. I, I did it poor, poorly, uh, if that was the impression. Both Film Finances, who was the bond company, and Fox Searchlight, who was the studio, although they were very nervous and concerned because we were, you know, we had a penny, we had no very, very, very we had no cushion financially <laughs> on that film. But they totally did understand that Tamara Jenkins was a unique artist who needed a unique way of working to deliver what she, what she wanted. You know, and I think that they were able to recognize that because that is very much Tamron's movie. It, it, it uh, you know, yes, she had to fight for certain things in the process. And yes, it probably did make everything better and more wanted. And it's not a surprise that that film got two Oscar nominations. Um, so. Along the way, yes, ex exactly. Um, there's a great quote from you where you say, when to speak up to a director and when to keep your mouth shut is a tricky art. Give me an example of that. Oh, like time and time again, I make the wrong choice in that, I have to say. It's, st it's still really hard. You know, um, you know, we do multiple takes. Okay, so Clint Eastwood may only do two takes and David Fincher may do 132, right? But people are looking for their own process. They're looking for, for something else. And, you know, because I, I, I want, I believe, and I'm, I feel like I've demonstrated to myself and others that I can be additive to the process. I'm working through a series of checklists in my mind that I have, you know, on how to enhance the scene, right? How can I make it better? But I'm not the director and I've learned why I'm not the director too. You know, so I see things and I want to try to fix them. And I know that, you know, we have limited time. So maybe we're gonna get three takes, maybe we're gonna get eight, maybe we're gonna get 12, but I've never had an opportunity to do 132, but I uh, know what I want to. Um, although I love his movies, so it works. Uh, um, so I'm trying to balance, like, when is the, the opportune time to say it, to fix it without interfering, whatever it is that the director may be chasing. I just don't recognize that that's what she's doing, you know? Um, so I try to bite my tongue until I feel like the opportunity is going to, to go away. That, you know, there are numerous times like where, where, I've then said, okay, I have to do it now. And like the, the director, different directors, just like Ted, I'm on that. Like I have that point. Um, or like, that's not, I'm working on something else that's even more important. It, it, it's so, it's so hard. And uh, I feel like sometimes I've done the exact opposite because I don't want to interfere. I, you know, bite my tongue. And then the director says, moving on. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we don't fix it. And like, there, there are things that are examples of that, like just because we were out in Savages and a friend of mine uh, teases me about this, like it's become like a metaphor for my life. Laura Linney's wig in that movie is just terrible. It is a terrible <laughs> wig. And we never should have let it happen. And I bit my tongue at some point because I got nervous about all the different pressures on financial, financially. And I can't watch that movie without seeing how bad her wig is. And I uh, feel really bad. But as a result, Tony Collette's wig in Towelhead is wonderful because I was like, I'm never gonna let that happen. $32,000 for a wig, no problem. Like they were the same budget. Yeah, you know, the other one, you know, I felt like, oh, we won. We got an eight hundred dollar hairpiece, you know, you know. So Ted Hope's wig budget will never be, <laughs> you know, uh, small again. <laughs> um, and enough um, good hair. I, I think that uh, that could be the um, takeaway quote from here. <laughs> um, 
What do you see as some of the transformative changes the industry is facing right now? Well. Take a sip of water first. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, from uh, my Elvis glass. <laughs> um, well, first it, it, it is that, right? That, that it was trending that way and COVID um, amped it up that we, we, we have experienced the, the shift from domination of the studios to domination of the global streamers, right? Now that has tons of repercussions around it, right? And then if you add into the, the possible factors that could occur uh, beca uh, because of COVID, even more so. I think that the the first thing is like, it's a completely different finance model. And as a result, it has potential to kill off the other finance model. And with, with, which I would say is twofold, both the independent finance model, which is predominantly still driven by foreign sales, you know, on it, because unless it's a very low budget film, it's very hard to go to a single financier to, for a movie and foreign sales allowed a equity financer to put in somewhere between 10 and 30% and between uh, pre-sales and banking, you could put something together. Combined with uh, di different national incentives, you know, the, the European, uh, subsidy model, uh, Canadian subsidy model, all of that. What these methods allowed for is non-conformative thinking, allowed for the outlet, the creative outliers to, to show that whatever was the, the, the status quo, the dominant belief on what audiences wanted to emerge and prove them wrong, right? Like my uh, another one of the great gifts I experienced in my career what was we were you know forced to sell wedding banquet ourselves um, and we had been told by repeated uh, sales agents that nobody wanted this film because it was gay and Chinese and felt like a film from the 40s and in the end when the people bought it and they said what they liked about it they said it was because it was gay in Chinese and felt like a film from the 40s, right? And it allowed me to, to recognize that, and I, I believe this so fully, that art and artists and audiences move much faster than our markets or our business, right? Like people who've taken Eco, e Econ 101, very different from Eco 101, Econ 101, um, kind of believe, oh yeah, the market is the great anticipator. I don't agree with that. I think that people learn to uh, like what they get and not get upset as opposed to getting what they like, right? And uh, th that's, a, that's a real process. We call that the, the white hair problem from Alice in Wonderland because that's actually what the white hair says. But um, the, the uh, kind of... Uh, recognizing that audiences and artists and uh, move faster is and change is I think going to be a real problem as we move even more so to this global conglomerate that uh, is you know necessary to become a global streamer and how much corporations can easily fall into kind of a house style, you know, across different genres and different forms, but having things they think is, are right for their audiences, but audiences are not, you know, just like the film business, the only constant is change. That's also true with audiences. And we actually need the, the more extreme examples, the outliers to, to show us the North Star where the rest of us will follow, you know, kind of halfway. And so I, I'm very concerned that without the independent finance model and the national subsidy model, that we will lose those very distinctive uh, voices. And I'm giving a lot of thought on how that can be done. And I have, a, I have an Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, I have a plan for that. Um, 
to, to some degree, but of course it's going to take many different plans in different places to make all of that work. But I think that, 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 you know, parsing that down, right? So, um, we, we do run a, a, a real risk when you look at that move toward, towards global streaming and full finance alongside what could happen with COVID, you know, the collapse of exhibition, it won't go away. I'm not saying that, but it's going to get uh, much smaller. A change in that model and what that's going to lead to is a uh, collapse of the regional distributor which will lead to a collapse of the foreign sales model, which uh, will lead to a collapse of the uh, U.S. Uh, private equity uh, financing, you know, which will then lead to a collapse of the outlier voices. How do you serve that, right? I think one of the great gifts of this change is the appetite of the streamers is much larger than we've ever seen before, right? And it's curious, like, uh, you know, when you combine that also with COVID, right? When I took the job at Amazon, I was convinced we were at most two years away from extreme competition. And what that meant to me, like five or six uh, global streamers. Well, it took five and a half years to get to the place that we had those. And they're still all U.S. dominant, right? They're all based on from U.S. companies to the degree that you can say a company is based in a uh, nation anymore. But uh, they're all driven by that. And we can expect that there will be um, global streamers that come out of Asia and come out of Europe and Latin America, Middle East. Like, there will be more, right? And when you look at the fact that these are, you know, digital platforms and real estate isn't an issue, and that uh, they are perpetual, they're not, you know, time-based, you start to recognize that, you know, and, and their goal, rather, their, their business goal is audience acquisition and retention, that the logical minimal number for any of these streamers uh, to have in terms of feature films is, is one a week, let's say 50 films, right? So, uh, and that's if, their main business, I would argue, is not actually uh, subscriptions and streaming titles. If because most of them, like Amazon and AT and T and Apple, all are selling other things than just streamers, right? You know, but it's a great way to gather people together is through the discovery of new uh, content. Um, that uh, you know, so those need fifty minimum, but a Netflix or someone that's only based on subscriptions around uh, entertainment. Um, they need even more, right? So you really are quickly are, are seeing like, okay, well, that's 350, 400 titles, plus we still have the remains of the old studio dominant regional distribution titles. So let's add another 250 titles, you know, um, on top of that. So all of a sudden we're looking for, you know, 650 new titles, and that's English language dominant. The big transformation is that very quickly, and this leads to many great things, is we, we shift from being a domestic-driven, U.S.-driven business to one that's truly a global business. We need authentic regional voices from each territory that speak to them. So then there's also the non-English language movies on top of that. How the hell are any of these companies going to manage that huge amount of workflow, right? That that they are not going to be able to supervise those films. So how does that go on? What is going to be the supervision structure? Because they still want assurances that they will get quality work within a given set of parameters, delivered on a uh, regular basis with minimal hassle. Right. Like like how are they going to be able to scale to that volume? And I think that that is going to lead to something very akin to what the, the 70s were for studio content, that they will have to rely on, uh, you know, third party uh, suppliers, creative voices that they trust of different sorts. You know, so I think we're going to get, you know, well, I'll hold the punchline, not really a punchline, I'll hold the tag 
to the other piece of that, like to just go back to that, uh, what does it mean to shift to uh, a global audience from a domestic audience, right? You know, film business is what, 120 year, years old or, or, or so in different ways. And it's always uh, been dominated by America, by the West, and by white, straight males of privilege, you know, from the, the, the West. So we may only have like 60 stories. Some people like to say there's only 60 stories and you just kind of change the perspective. But they've all been uh, told through the perspective and point of view of the American cowboy, essentially, right? One person as, you know, in one way. And that just doesn't make any business sense. Forget about social, political sense. Over half your customers are not that you know, by all means. So you, you, and when you uh, engage in the nature of streaming, which is, hello, I finally have access to everything, anywhere, at any time when I want it, or at least the perception that I do. And they all look like Ted Hope. Um, you know, you, you kind of start to say, well, no, I'd like to have m myself represented. You've been doing it one way for 120 years. And because of that, we are now going to, you know, I think I, I think everybody recognizes that period, you know, and we will see that from a business perspective, not even social, political, cultural, and we will see as a result a huge new range of perspectives that I think will change and expand the storytelling form, you know, the 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 stories. Like I think we're going to, you know, hit a real golden age. Um, of of new voices who are given permission uh, and free reign to you know explore you know their their vision. Um, okay, I have to. I now have to um, segue to the audience questions, but um, I have a great one to start, which actually will lead right into. I mean, you can kind of continue with what you were saying because it's thematically in the same vein, but. Christopher Batista is asking, um, the Academy has released news that they plan to set new diversity standards and rules to ensure more equitable film practices. What do you think is the best way to ensure we create a more equitable film ecosystem in which stories from multiple perspectives are allowed to breathe and exist in their own right and not be held up against some semblance of the white gaze? Excellent question. I think it's a really simple answer is that we need universal basic income across the globe. <laughs> you know, like that, because unfortunately it really does come down to that because that's, you know, storytelling is a financial privilege. And unless you find a way to address that, it's never going to be fair or just, right? Um, you know, so that we're not going to solve that piece. But um, I think that, you know, it's been interesting. Uh, it was super interesting for me to get to sit in the executive chair and kind of see all of the challenges and how hard it is, even when you have a team of people who are champion sort of things like you, you frequently hit different walls in getting things made. Eventually you learn, you know, where the cracks and the footholds are and how to scale or break through. But um, I do think the fact that A, we're at this moment of transformative change and that it is so different that actually uh, the experience to be a leader hasn't yet been gained and that, uh, but by anybody. So I think new leaders will emerge. And I think it, it is one of the reasons why large corporations filled with the best and the brightest have been given uh, license to make some big choices and some change on that. And we'll start to see that. But, you know, um, at the same time, that, that, we we need to embrace a, a different process to to make excellent work. Um, and there are things that become clear to me uh, that are needed in that the producers, you know, the people that are, uh, I think, uh, 
in charge, you know, responsible for lifting the good into the great. And that's across the project, across the people and across all the processes. That's how I decided this morning to answer the question of what is producing. That is the, to me, the, the answer of what is producing, lifting the good into the great across those th three things, people, projects, and processes. I'll change it tomorrow, but uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's one. And um, that, that we, we uh, need to quickly accelerate how quickly those individuals who pra pra practice what I would call a holistic manner of producing, which is also for me, like that's all producing should be. And that's being involved in everything from the concept to the, the financing, to the creative, to the delivery, to the marketing and distribution and impact to the ecosystem, right? Like that, that, that's the role I think a producer should have. We need to generate far more producers quickly and into a level where they actually can afford to do this vocation because it's, you know, a good life, but a bad, you know, profession. We have to get them in there so that those voices can be heard and that their decision, you know, des uh, decision makers can fill those ranks because as much as I think th things are, people are being woken up and things are changing, it's still, we still have a long time before the executives, both on a project basis and on a company basis, reflect our population, right? That it, it you know, and unless somebody is going to say, like, I'm going to sw sweep everybody out and sweep new people in, um, which isn't a bad idea. Um, I do remember like years ago at, I think like five years ago at, at TIFF, I think it was uh, Joey Soloway um, was giving a, a master class. And at that time, uh, proper pronoun would have been she um, s said, we just have to say that uh, all men will stop making movies for, for 10 years. And then uh, we'll, we'll finally get to something closer to what it should be. Um, interesting idea. But uh, I, I think that, that it, to me, like that's, I'm producer biased. I think it comes down to that. We need to uh, deepen what it means to be producing, provide ample men mentorship and tools and accelerated earnings so that those leaders can emerge because I, I, I think that they can and they will and they will point to the right direction that I, I've, I expect that we will uh, see those ranks highly diversified within a five-year time with new leaders emerging. Um, and that will change who are the storytellers and who are the executives as a result. But it, you know, it will take some initiatives and I, I have some real thoughts on that. And some, I've been able to share them with some folks and folks have uh, responded very positively to them. Um, I'm not ready to talk about it here now, but uh, I, I do think everyone recognizes that that need and change will come. Okay. Um, we have a question from Bracken Burns, who I think is uh, starting a career in producing. And the question is, how did you find your first stories, your first writers? Did the scripts come to you? Um, I'd love some input on how to find the right script or story to produce. Excellent question, Bracken. Um, the lucky thing for me is like my first, and I think for most producers, uh, my first 10 movies that I produced were utter failures. In that, they never got made, right? Because probably those projects that I found weren't, you know, some of them might have been worthy of getting made, but uh, I'm glad that I didn't get them made, but I learned a lot in that process. And I, th I think that in the beginning, like that's really what you're trying to do is improve your skills. And those skills include how to work with somebody in development, how to improve a script, how to develop the stamina of whatever number of drafts it takes. Cause sometimes it's taken over 40 drafts 
you know, uh, to get a project of mine right. Sometimes it's only taken two or even one to get uh, greenlit. But um, you have to develop those skills. So success isn't necessarily getting the movie made. It's learning from that experience early on. And really, the the way projects came to me was every which way. But um, along the way, I had a conscious effort to try to uh, provide different um, marketable skills to the process that would be magnets to bring the projects to me. So for instance, like Ang Lee came to us because um, uh, a screenwriter he had collaborated with, David Lasserson, had um, been a PA with me. And I had already started to develop a reputation for making movies super cheap. That if you wanted to make a movie for very little amount of money, you should come to Ted Hope um, or Ted Hope and James Seamus or whoever I was working with at the time, because there was a handful of people I certainly did it with. And, um, you know, the way we wrote, raised money for films in those days was to cut the budget in half, right? We'll raise half your budget, or we'll be responsible for half your budget. We're just going to remove it from, from the equation. And that was the, the truth with uh, the wedding banquet. We worked really hard on what was initially a $1.5 million movie and we raised half the money and we made it for that amount, $700,000. Um, I think that, that uh, the, again, that the process of that is also one that starts in ways far earlier, right? Defining what you love is such a critical part of producing. And for me, it was a, I didn't do it until it was almost too late. And it took me close to three years to really do it in a thorough way that I've since refined uh, year in and year out. And it helps me spot stories and individuals and kind of circumstances that I want to work in faster now by having done that work. Right. You know, both what I love about movies, you know, why I love movies and what those aspects are and trying to get super specific and then having those conversations with other people. So that you find those that are like minded, you know, because uh, so, because you really do need a team approach to get things made um, that that feels similarly and really being willing to um take on projects at a wide variety of stages that I think that it, it helps having some super long-term development. Like I have projects I've worked on almost my entire life that I think of in a, in a dreamy way, you know, and what is needed. But those things that I'm working on find their way into the other projects that are much more immediate and executable. Um, you know, so, so, some of that is relate long-term relationship-based spotting short films, music videos, commercials that I like, tracking the, those directors, looking to bring myself into their orbits, how I can uh, do that, having lots of different things that I like to talk about, you know, story worlds of different sorts, genres of different sorts, work of other people, so that when I do get to be close to them, I can start to throw out some ideas and find that that common ground. I think all of it, you have to take a real longitudinal approach to producing that, you know, you, you know, you might find that story with that already established that that already established director wants. And that's called good fortune. You know, much more is the long term engineering of tracking people's work, watching how they develop finding your overlap, you know, and then sending out those beacons that, that I'm an expert in this field, in this uh, genre, in this method, in this uh, demographic, you know, so then you have a value add that you can bring to any process. I hope that helps.
And I'm afraid we're out of time. So that is uh, the end of this masterclass. And it has been really fun for me. I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it. Um, and thank you, Ted, for uh, tuning, uh, zooming in, whatever software we're on. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, thank you, Tatiana. This, this was really great fun and uh, excellent job. And you know, uh, to the degree that anyone didn't get to answer, uh, ask a question, or there's more things to discuss, I'm really reachable on social media. I may not respond right away, but if there are questions and answers, it's why I use Twitter and why I have a professional Facebook page is to try to address these. Because I've learned a great deal by the questions that people ask, because I frequently need to be brought back to reality of the, the hard work of getting established. So uh, I really appreciate people engaging with me. So thanks. All right. Fantastic. Um, bye. <laughs> bye, -bye.